Let's do this. I want to hear about them. Okay, we'll do it on the podcast. Yeah, uh, we're we're going. Oh, we've already started. Yeah, we're starting. You know, can't say like "Good morning." It's nice to see you. Something. Well, we already Give did a that. Heads up. If it sounds bad, I won't put it out. <laughs> no, I have a question just to kind of like just you know just warm up, and we'll I'll check the levels. Um, what's your morning routine? Do you have one? Yes. What is it? It is. I get up way way early. Okay. I get up earlier than everybody else in my house. Which okay. Is my favorite. Which is day. what time? Like. For some families, way today, early could be seven, probably, some could be four, thirty or five. This is today. Today it was four forty-five because okay. I knew I had to go walk and at six thirty. Okay. So I get up and just have a cup of tea, just either write or read or email, or I might just light a candle and lay there and be quiet. But when I write and I'm writing, you know, I have I would say I have seasons of writing. But I'm not, I haven't been in a season of writing for a couple of months. But when I'm in a season, I go hide in the bathtub in the morning around 4.30 or 5, and I write for a couple hours before I get everybody up. Are you writing stuff that people are going to see, like mm-hmm. articles or book, mm-hmm. next, next book? Mm-hmm. Okay. Just I, plugging away I, at that. I'm, I'm, the book is um, called Love Heals. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, my God, that's been whatever. I mean, it's on every T-shirt we've sold and every yeah. candle. So we finished. It's the most beautiful book I've written. As far as like if you look at a book and it's beautiful and it has, you know, the images of thistles and teacups and the oils we use. So everything that we're about is, you know, visually presented in this book. And I got to write poetry for every chapter. So I mean, it's I'm excited about it. That's amazing. When does it come out? out, Well, I just found out Target's going to carry it. Oh, no way. Way. I just found out last night. That's amazing. Isn't it? That's that's (laughs) that's incredible. Right. I mean, Target's kind of a big deal. To get into that. Right, because I don't think they have many books. They have, I mean, the bigger targets have a few hundred, but when you think about the thousands of books that come out every month, to get in the few hundred is, it's amazing. I'm so That's happy. Awesome. Hello, dear friends. Welcome back to the Let's Give a Damn podcast. We couldn't be more excited about what we're cooking up in our podcast laboratory for you. As a reminder for those tuning in for the first or 17th time, because this is episode 17, Let's Give a Damn is a place where we share the stories of people who saw a need and gave a damn about it. Martin Luther King Jr. said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. This podcast, therefore, is especially for the unsilent people, people who refuse to settle for the way things are right now and see them more for the way things can be. Before we get into the show, a quick word from the sponsor for this show. I want to tell you a bit about my friends at Scout Books in Portland, Oregon, a company that really does give a damn. They make custom pocket notebooks for your brand, business, event, or anything else you might want a sweet notebook for. But what really makes Scout Books unique is that they make all their books with 100% recycled paper and they run their shop off of renewable energy. Scout Books also sponsors projects that benefit organizations doing good like the ACLU and the National Forest Foundation. They recently launched a book called We the People Are Powerful, a field guide to getting active in local politics which is a place where individual action can really make a difference. So if you, the Let's Give a Damn listener, want to make a guide for taking action in your own community or create a fundraiser giveaway or just check out some well-made notebooks, Scout Books is offering 15% off anything in their store. Go check out the following links to get 15% off Scout Books. That's scoutbooks.com slash giveadamn. Again, that's scoutbooks.com slash let's give a damn to get 15% off anything and everything in their store. Now, back to introducing the show. Today, you get to listen in on a conversation I had with my new friend and superhuman, Becca Stevens. Now, Becca lives in Nashville with her family. 20 years ago, she started Thistle Farms. You are going to know all about Thistle Farms by the end of this talk but I wanted to give you a heads up as to what we're getting into. They heal, empower, and employ women survivors of trafficking, prostitution, and addiction. And they have done so for thousands and thousands of women over the years. They do this through their housing program, through their education programs, 
and through their global market, where they employ and partner with different organizations, empowering women to create amazing products and to get them out to you. So I was deeply affected by this talk. I spent days after our talk just thinking through and processing through what we talked about. And I know that you're going to do a few things after this talk. You're gonna love Becca Stevens. You're gonna go follow her online everywhere because she's amazing and she shares amazing resources and words of encouragement. And her hashtag, what you'll learn about in here, love heals, is something that I hope you begin using because it truly, truly does. I'm so excited for you to hear this talk. So I will shut up, let's get right into it. So without further ado, I'm Nick LaPara. This is the Let's Give a Damn podcast, and you're listening to my conversation with Becca Stevens. Let's start, because I want to figure out, um, we're going to get to Thistle Farms, we're going to get to the different ways that you give a damn, the things that you've done. But I want to get, and you talked to, uh, for briefly about your younger years. Go back as far as you want to, but tell me about growing up. Tell me about your family, your um, the 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 situations you found yourself in. Help us. You can you can skim as quickly as you want to, or as slow as you want to. Give me a sense as to like what made you who you are today. Was it your, your, your parents, your upbringing, or was it this fluke thing, this, you know, this experience you had when you were 18, 20, 25? Like, I just want to get a this. sense for like, how did you become who you are? You know, I'm, I am my father's and mother's daughter. Okay. I really, really am. What you're looking at or hearing is um, really a, a generational experience. So my dad was an Episcopal priest. He was killed by a drunk driver when I was five. Oh, man. Um, so I didn't know him, but I knew stories about him, and I think it was really influential about, you know, really what it means to care for people and to try to live your faith in really practical daily ways, not um, not tons of um, politics, not tons of fancy stuff, just real practical stuff. My mom, um, so she was a single mom. She worked in daycare, raising five kids. Mm. And she loved children, and she loved community. So I had these parents that were very community-minded, very loving, compassionate people. Um, after my dad died, we had the guy that took over leading the church started sexually abusing me in the church, and it went on for years. And so I knew the really bad side, I mean the really bad side of what community and church and institutions can look like and how, you know, they can be fairly destructive. And I also knew early on that that wasn't going to be my story of some kind of victim of this guy, that I wanted to... Um, I even knew then, I think, that I was stronger than he was. Mm. Um, and I don't know where that came from, that sense of like wanting to um, not let kind of that stuff outweigh the love stuff that my parents were giving me and all that. It wasn't that I didn't go through some crazy stuff or some trouble or feeling lost, but I always had a, I think I had a deeper foundation than some of the trauma of the death and abuse. You just mentioned two really huge things. Mm -hmm. Your dad died when you were five. Mm -hmm. I don't. I'm like I, in a really bad, tragic yes. car crash. Right. How did you, drunk driver. You're, you're five. I, I have a five-year-old. Uh -huh. I can't even begin to comprehend how she would process that at five what how did you I'm telling you I had an amazing amazing mom mm -hmm. I mean that you know she was like she was safe she was a rock you could go back to her I didn't see her a ton because she had to work so much but I always knew I had loving parents I never doubted that even though my dad was dead I never doubted it mm -hmm. I did um you know always really question um a lot about just idiotic kind of rote responses people gave out of their faith. Oh, gosh, yeah. I hate all that stuff, and I hated it even then, you know, just like, you know, you can, you know, pray for a miracle, but if a semi-truck hits a Volkswagen Beetle, you know, it's not about God saving, choosing to save or not save. It's 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 just physics. It's a tragic death. It's a tragic it death, is. you know, but I'm, I'm just saying, like, you, yeah. don't have, you don't have a chance. No. 
And no, 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 yeah. Yeah, and so it's like I never had a problem. Like God was never my problem. Like I never felt like unloved or hmm. any of that. There were a lot of problems. God wasn't one of them. That's a gift. But the institutional part of it really was a problem. Sure. Yeah. And so t- so so then it was like when I I knew though again it's like I wanted the story to be different about what community could do and how people could come together and be loving and compassionate without judgment. And, you know, helped some people who had some, maybe some of the same issues I had around, you know, sexual abuse as a little kid. So when we started Thistle Farms in Magdalene, I think those experiences really fed into what, why this model looks like it does and why it's a really good model for people who've also gone through this stuff. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I knew it was not going to be a religious organization. Mm-hmm. I could act out of my faith and live into my faith. But Thistle Farms was not going to be mm. faith based, where you had to say you believed sure. stuff to be a part of it. Yeah, because I think that it for me it was that is controlling, and that was the beginning of a lot of hurt. Mm. I knew I wanted to be free. I mean, like we were talking about growing up poor, and you know, people are saying you know you can't value something unless you pay for it. And it's like we loved free stuff. I don't know about your family, but like, oh my gosh, there's free shampoo. Yep. In that, yep. you know, hotel room, that was one of the biggies or whatever it was. And, um, you know, <laughs> yes. somebody give you something yep. free, it was yep. awesome. Yeah. So I wanted the whole thing to be free. And plus, you know, people, the women that we work with are first abused between the ages of 7 and 11, first hit the streets between 14 and 16 years old. They are monetized early. And to have, say, like, money is not a part of it was huge. So it was, you mm. know, free two years, and then the last part that was huge for me was there was no authority in the house. So in every community that we are a part of at Thistle Farms, there's no authority living in the house with the women who who do this work of recovery mm. from all their trauma. And that's because if you do have a history of child sexual abuse, authority is one of your biggest triggers. If somebody oh, totally. tells you, like, look, this is how it is, this is how it's going down, it's like... No, it's not what we're doing here because it's not safe. So we just took that out so that women could just be together and just say, you know, we want to be supportive of you. There's, I mean, it's a very rigorous program, but there's no authority in the house. You can go home and be in your home for two years. It's not going to cost you anything, and you just need to breathe, feel loved, and keep doing this work So because what you're going to do is you're going to help the next woman come off the streets. Yeah, That's what you're going to do. Yeah. So let's talk about Thistle Farms. I'll be completely honest. Up until about six months ago, I wasn't aware of you or Thistle Farms. We have a lot of mutual friends here in this city, and a lot of they're all fans of yours. Um, So anyway, talk about Thistle Farms. How did it get started? What do you do? What are the ramifications of it? I want to hear as much as you want to tell, but I just think it's just an incredible uh, thing you've created with the global market. You just walked me through the warehouse and the things you guys are selling and making. You're making them right over here. Who's making them? Like, g- give me the give me the lowdown on this place. Um, Thistle Farms. We started like 20 years ago. I mean, it started so t- long time ago, and it feels like that. It feels like it was a. Me- it's like a distant memory. The beginnings of it for me now, which is crazy. Wow. Like this feels really real. What's going on now? And so to go back, it's like. It's like a dream, and it was so simple. It was just one house, five women, and we just said, come be in the house for two years. Don't pay anything. Nobody's going to tell you what you have to do. Mm. We're all just going to support you. How did you pay for that at that point? Just out of your own? Mm -mm. Just raise money. Yeah, just raise some money. And knew I knew that it was like if it was just one house, five women, and I was, you know, I was already ordained in the Episcopal Church and was making a living. Okay. At yeah. Vanderbilt University. So I wasn't worried about paying me, and we didn't need a lot of staff, so I had some volunteer help. And I mean, we did that, I think, the whole year for like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Oh, wow. You know, and you realize, you start realizing a small group of women in community are pioneers that can start changing mm. a whole culture, change legislation, change mm. a community – change old, just worn out myths about women, change, um, you know, this belief that like, if you can't help 20 million people who are trafficked, then you shouldn't do anything, but you can help this small group. And it can be leadership that are survivor leaders that, you know, do change stuff. And they, 
can undercut these like old systems and bu- bureaucracies that don't serve anybody, and hmm. they can undermine you know some of this crazy prison ridiculous sentencing that goes on in our country. All of that stuff can happen by helping one group of women, five women. That's why it feels so dreamy because it seems like I had no idea at the time that's what was happening. Mm. I was just wanting to help some people because yeah. so many people would help me. I had had so much mercy in my life. I mean, so much. It could have gone so much another way for me. Mm. And it was like, okay, I want to do that for somebody else. And so I was just doing it because I was grateful. I had, you know, my husband was just, I mean, he was a big, huge gift given to me, mm. you know, in this world as a partner. And didn't think everybody had that. And I was able to breeze through school. Not everybody has that. Mm. You know, I had some, I had a loving mother. Not everybody has that. Yeah. You know, so we had some bad. So many gifts. We had so many bad things, but there was also so many good things. So, you know, once the first house opened, women came, they stayed, they stayed, they stayed, they stayed, they stayed. And so we had to get another house and mm. another house. And that was when I realized that what I needed was, um, I used to call it a, uh, we used to call it a cottage industry. Then we changed it to a social enterprise, but now I'm done calling it a social enterprise. Okay. I'm calling it a justice enterprise. Okay. Because I think social is implied. If sure. it's an enterprise, it has to involve more than one person, so it's social. So I don't understand. And that word has so many, it's used and abused, unfortunately. Like to say you're like somebody that's about social change or right. social And you this can't or just say that. enterprise, or they're going to think sure. you're a car rental company. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's not a con- yes, right? Exactly. You can't just call myself an enterprise. So anyway, we're gonna we're this justice enterprise that started. And I love it. Was it. A, it's because a hundred percent of the women that we serve have reported rape. One hundred percent. So, um, and some just horrific, as you can imagine, just awful stories on that. Just very violent. So, we. Um, we thought we should make something really healing for the body, and that's how we started with the candles mm. and the oils. Um, you could just light a candle and be at peace. You could put body balm on your body. Both of them have pretty good shelf life, so it wasn't like we had to figure out how to sell it all. Both of them are really easy to make. So it wasn't like now we yeah. get into all these head-to-body, I mean, sorry, head-to-toe body washes. That is so more, away above my it's ability. More complicated. It's really complicated. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just gonna start um, in the next couple months because we're gonna start a new project in Nigeria. I'm just starting to learn how to make Castile soap, um, mm. but I would not have wanted to start manufacturing Castile soaps. Starting with a body bomb is really easy. So we did that, and we were just I just used a little chapel we had over at Vanderbilt, so I had zero overhead. And a few women came. You were the chaplain there, is that? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm still a chaplain. Okay, there. okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, we just kept going, and then we grew, and then we found another home and another home, and then we kept growing. And it was and we ended up being the largest social enterprise or justice enterprise of its kind in the U.S., you know, that are run by women survivors, led by it. I mean, you see it, like all those departments you just walked through. Yeah. Those are all women who graduated, who have taken on leadership, who do the training of all the new women coming through. You know, more than I think it's 60, 65 percent of all employees for the whole entire company and not for profit are survivor leaders. So, wow, it's you know, I mean, it is what, what are the numbers there? So, um, I don't know. you said non profit and so non profit and company, two different things, it's the same, same, same not for profit, okay. But I'm saying both on the residential right. side right. Okay. and on the oh, yeah, yeah, okay, and on the manufacturing side, on both sides of that, there's survivor leaders who are doing. You know, they have gone back and gotten their degree in counseling, or they're the bankers, or they're the manufacturing directors, or the purchase agents, or who, you know, I mean, like all those things. They run the retail stores, they run the shipping department. All of that is about run by women who have been surviving trafficking, addiction, and prostitution. Every, I mean, you know, so that's the goal is to keep doing that. And so then we, you know, the numbers, it started that people wanted to come in from around the country. We've probably had um, somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 people come in for training. Oh, wow. Here. We just had a national conference. I um, saw that. 
300 folks from 35 states were just here June 4th through 6th. They represent part of the, depends on how you count it and what stages they're in, but there's about somewhere between 40 and 50 sister communities around the country. So they take this model and they have their own 501c3 not-for-profit and they open up a house and they let women come in and um, live for two years free without authority in the house. And then that's why we're part of this capital campaign that we've just finished that you saw the renovations for. Mm -hmm. Part of that is is this National Education and Training Center so we can keep training on this model and keep growing this network so we can do things around legislation, so we can keep expanding. You know, if we're in 35 states right now, we need we need safe, safe communities for women in all 50 states. All of them. And it's crazy not to. And it's it's not a shelter. It's not a treatment program. It's not a halfway house. These are long-term communities for women to really heal and take leadership in ending trafficking for women in the U.S. It's really kind of a little overwhelming. I mean, just for me, um, you know, you took me on a tour. I'm walking through. You don't even have to tell me that these are, you know, women that have been through the pro. Like, I I can just tell. that I, I, I can tell they're happy to be here. I can see gratitude in their faces. Um, and, yeah, they're happy. I, I walk, like, everybody's happy. Everybody. Every, it's just, this is a happy place. These are people that have experienced healing. Yes. So what's the dream? I know you said you want to keep doing it, but, like, um, I don't mean to be, this, I hope this doesn't sound crass. Like, if you dropped dead today, this is already just an, a magnificent thing that's been worked on for 20, like, great work has been done. Um, hopefully you have 40 more years of this, 50, 40, whatever. What, 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 he says, I do no, not want to I don't do want to do this 40, for 50 years. What, what's the dream? What, 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 what do we keep doing here? I don't know. So I don't, I don't really work that way where I have like, I don't even really believe in really clear laid out vision. Sure. Okay. Kind of run with it, pivot. But and- well, the reason is, is like, I like the idea that, I mean, like if you just look in scriptures, Moses, Moses, when he goes up on Mount Sinai, all he gets is a glimpse of the back of a head. I trust that. Yeah. If somebody's like, this is the clear vision and how it has to go, it's like, you know, you need to be open to what the community is looking for and needing and adaptable and dependent on each other. If it's just your vision, just your thing, it may never outgrow, it will never outgrow you. What I love about what you're seeing at Thistle Farms, this isn't my vision. At all. Mm. I mean, I had a hope, and maybe I had a glimpse of the back of a head of how women could be together, but that's Mm. all I had. You just ran with it. Just totally ran with it and believed that people will come together and something beautiful will happen that couldn't happen outside it. I mean, the reason women heal in communities is something magical happens. The reason this works is that it's a community. And so people are bringing ideas and bringing thoughts and changing things and bringing their skills. So... It's not like we're deciding things by committee. I hate that. Mm. But there is a communal vision, and people are bringing their gifts, and people are respecting those gifts. So one of the things that's really been calling me, the glimpses I've had, have really been around these international communities. Mm. So we have about 24 global partners. And when I say that, I mean it's like a clearinghouse for small groups and communities around the world that they can come together. We have an e-commerce site together. We're committed to helping each other. We're committed to paying survivors more than mm. fair trade. So we're calling it shared trade. So 60% goes back oh, wow. into the community without paying any distribution. So we'll do the distribution and shipping without any of that, um, any of that tra- being charged. And so the next thing in my head, the next glimpse, and we just had our first meeting about it, is it's a you know, a cooperation between a group in Nigeria that's just starting out called um, Anchor House for young women in Benin City, Nigeria, who've been trafficked. I think 90% of all the girls trafficked out of Nigeria come from Benin City. They're trafficked into Eastern Europe, and they come back, and they have nothing. Mm. No money. They have, you know, just unbelievable trauma. They have no education. You know, they're sick. All these things. They really need a home to go to. So a woman who is Nigerian, who is an attorney now in New York from Benin City, 
is going back to build this house there. And what we want to do is partner, and we want to start a line of products that are cleaning products. Hmm. And we're going to use the oils out of Rwanda from our partner there. And we just had a meeting with everybody starting just to dream about it together and see what parts people could do. But this would be like an all-natural high-end line of cleaning products, and that's why we're going to start developing Castile soap with just essential oils in it. And the idea would be the marketing on it is going to be about we need to clean up this mess. Mm. And not just in our own lives but in the world. Yeah. It's time to clean up this mess. Whether we're poisoning the earth from the cleaning products we're pouring down it or killing the young girls because we're selling them as commodities, it's time to clean it up. Mm. And so that won't be until next summer. So I guess my next thing really is just thinking about how to continue to support these small groups that are starting these justice ministries around the world and make sure we all stay connected because we all do better. I mean, justice is not a competitive sport. Mm -mm. So we need each other. Like, you and I need each other. You need to get this out, and I need you to get this Mm. out, you know? Yeah. This is really great. I'm 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 just taking it all in. I love this stuff. Like I love that you've stuck with this for 20 years. People don't stick with stuff anymore. I love the success that you This is successful, you know, like that's a very you know, what does that word even mean? You know, right. what does success mean? But this is this is a success and I'm just really excited to I'm just excited. I'm just thinking through like what can forget let's give a damn. What can I do to help out? What can, you know, we're going to start buying candles from here. You know, like what can I help? What can I do to help this go along? Because this is great. Like this is, I'm a big fan of people. So I'm a millennial um, and a lot of people that That sounded that are, so braggy to me. I'm just going to say it's, that. It's, it's not hey, really. I'm a millennial. It's, I'm a millennial. Um, people, well, based on what I'm about to say, it's not bragging. We, we, we are, we're a very ambitious group of people that aren't typically, or it's hard to be okay with having these, starting out with, like like you did 20 years ago, five people in a house. Mm-hmm. Like what we want to do, because, because so many opportunities are afforded to us and there's so much that we can do. There's so much technology and resources at our disposal. We want to go just like take over the world, right? And we like to, to think about, no, just five, five. Five is so few. Like just five, Nick? Like just five, Becca? Like mm-hmm. five? And you did it. And you stuck with it for 20 years. And here you are. And I just love this story. I want people that are listening because the main demographic of people that are listening are, you know, 18 to 35. They're young people that want to give a damn. They want to make a difference. One of my favorite quotes um, is one of the things that I'm basing everything that I'm going to do for the rest of my life on is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And so I want to surround myself and I want to train up and I want to influence the unsilent people, people that at, at any and all cost won't be silent about things that matter, right? Mm-hmm. And that's you. Hopefully that's me. Um, and so I'm just real, real excited about this. I think there's a lot of pressure, though, when you start something or when you're doing something and you feel like it's got to be big and it's got to be new and it's got to be interesting. It's like this is neither none of that. I mean, really, what you're looking at in this community is really old. It's love. Yeah. You're looking at something really not complicated, women coming together. You know, I think sometimes if I thought I had to start, you know, I— There wasn't even a major in social enterprise when we started this. It was just like you Mm. made a candle and you sold it to a friend for 10 bucks. Yeah. That's all it was. It was not hard. And I don't know that I would have started out if I ever thought like, okay, my job is to stop prostitution in America. That's like ridiculous. Yeah. Or, you know, make sure everybody, that's not our job. Our job is not to take over the world. Our job is not to even change the world. Mm Mm-hmm. Our job is to love it. Love. Our job is to love, to love each other, to love the world, which means like all of us keep changing so we can love it. You know, when you talk about success too, it's like this is a really interesting week to talk about success. We just had, you know, a murder in our community. Mm. And it was horrible. Horrible. The circumstances were horrible. How it happened, the tragedy of it, it's about, really all the issues you know that you can imagine boiling down into one scene and one innocent victim being killed you know i won't go into all of it but sure. what happened was 
for me is the next morning, everybody came back together. Every morning we start in a circle and we light a candle and we say, we light this candle for the woman still on the street and the woman trying to find her way home. Mm. And it was a success. In the middle of that tragedy, all those injustices, all the laws that need to be changed, all the craziness of addiction, all the violence in society, all of it in the midst of all that, even in the face of that, we came back and lit another candle. And I think that is successful. Because mm. um, right when you said that, I thought, isn't this an interesting week to think about it when we're just all grieving? Mm. Um, anyway, I do think it is like the whole thing of um, if our job is to love the world, then I have to do that every day, whether or not I'm inspired to or I feel like it. So on days that we're grieving and appreciating the cost of, you know, what addiction and trafficking and prostitution has done to women in this world, even on those days, we keep loving it. Mm-hmm. Love heals. Mm-hmm. You use that a lot. Mm-hmm. And I love it. I've started kind of ripping it off of you a little what? bit. I'll give you all the credit. What? I'll tell everybody. Everybody, if I ever use Love Heals, it's because of Becca Stevens. Use it everywhere. Like all, you can you know, use it without giving you me hash, credit. I didn't make I, that up. No, you didn't. But you, but you're the champion of it for sure. Like so, mm. I, I mean, it's a truth. But like, how did you start using it, and why has that become like the uh, yeah the mantra? It's everywhere. It's all around the building. It's on the shirts. Right. I think we. I mean, it was a process. Um, you know. It's what it was doing to us. And I mean, all of us in this community, It was that was what was the healing entity. And so it made sense if you're making bath and body care products that you want to be healing, mm. that it's not like um, lavender heals, even though it does, or just the geranium heals, even though it does, or, you know, the peace that you get if you light this candle with all essential oils, mm-hmm. you know, you know, it was, it was about love. And so it made sense just to get it down to love heals everybody. Every single person love is healing. You know, we've met women, you know, God, that have been, you know, jailed, prostituted, beaten, imprisoned. I already said that, but all those things you can do to folks. And yet they still hope and they're hoping for love. I mean, that's, we're just human beings. It's, yeah. You know, and I think that's, that's what I love. I love thinking that no matter what or where you are in this world, you can have some sense of hope and some sense that love is going to be there with you, no matter where. I mean, no matter how deep the ditch. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't cost it doesn't, any money. It doesn't right. take... I mean, it takes effort to do, but it's there. It's available for yes. us. We can begin doing it. We can receive it. We can give it. Um, yeah, I, was I get that. I sinking down pretty deep in that chair. <laughs> you getting comfortable. I was like, I'm ready to go to sleep. You've been uh, recognized on a lot of platforms and stages and stuff. Um, and I know you don't, I, it's very clear, having been with you for coming up on an hour now, it's very clear that you don't do it for that. But has there been any one that was more meaningful than you know the others? You've been featured in New York Times, on ABC, 2016 CNN Hero, which I watch. I've watched that video a few times because I found it very impactful. You know, for one, Taraji Henson, Octavia Spencer, you know, introduced they introduced that award. Like that's a cool thing. You know, they're in human. Uh, they're in Hidden Figures, that very impactful movie, and uh, I think they're great women. And so I thought that Do was. Do you want cool. to know the truth? Yeah, I didn't know who they were. You don't know where they, who they were. Okay. Uh-uh. And you know why? It's because I don't go to movies. Sure. So I don't. And it's not like yeah. because they were young or those are movies I didn't see. It was like, I mean, I spent a lot of time raising three boys, and the only yeah. time I would ever have to go to a movie, you know, I mean, it's going to be Transformers. Yeah, there you, you go. Know the, what big, I mean? the big, yeah, the big blockbuster kind like of. Like yeah. only every now and then, and it was like, I don't really watch that many movies, yeah. and it was so. Then I watched some of their stuff and it was like I loved them and yeah. I loved them afterwards but before yeah. it was like going you're like oh cool that's awesome yeah. I, I knew who Richard Gere was I think on sure. that stage and yeah. that was probably just about it yeah that's awful that's, don't spit hey, that on there no that's this, embarrassing. Is, this is going it's fine they're they're not going to listen that means you were busy doing doing stuff right that's not you should never apologize for not watching or movies. I tell you what though like like if you are going on an overseas trip and you would watch like three or four in a row on a plane or but, whatever well, I yeah. wouldn't know who the actors were sure you're just watching it to like pass the time because you have a 15 right. hour flight Right. 
Um, 2016 CNN Hero, White House Champion of Change, Humanitarian of the Year by the Small Business Council of America. You, you're in the T Tennessee Women's Hall of Fame. Like, first of all, that's crazy. Congrats. Now, again, not that you live for that, but that's that's cool. You're doing meaningful work that people are recognizing. Are, have any of those been more special than the other? Like, have any of them meant more for a certain reason or no? Not really. I mean, I thought the thing that I liked was getting to know the way the CNN did it is they nominate 10 people and then you spend the whole weekend with the 10 people. Hmm. And we were up in New York for a weekend and I got to be friends with all the other folks who were nominated for the Hero of the Year. And... The mantra was, the thing that was so funny to me, they kept saying, these are ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Ordinary people, like somebody's not ordinary. Like who is the not ordinary person? The actors? That's, I mean, how does that really make you- You want to know something that's really funny? Not ordinary. That was the tagline that I used when I started and I changed it for that very reason. Yeah. So I started out with, let's give a damn, and let's give a damn, we share the stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary work. And- Quickly, like three episodes in, I was like, I can't do that. Right. That's that's a bad thing. That's a wrong, bad, incorrect way to present it. And one of my friends, Scott Erickson, an amazing artist, he called me up and was like, dude, I love the pot. This is great. I don't know if you should say that. And we started talking and chatting. I was like, oh, I can't say that. Like, I don't want to say that. Not that right. I can't. I don't want to say because of what, so what you're bringing happened, up. Well, what happened was for me that weekend is that everybody was telling stories about the communities they were serving. So Luma was talking about these kids who were refugees coming and playing s this amazing soccer. And Harry was talking about all these kids with cerebral palsy mm. who were riding horses and on and on. It came. You know, Craig was talking about young survivor, cancer survivors going down a river. And all of a sudden I went, you know what the biggest gift is, is all of us are serving extraordinary people doing the most ordinary things. Mm. Mm, I, wanna, I like that. Like I want to ride Let's a horse. Let's reverse it, yeah. I want to have a job. Have, you know, I want to go down a river and feel the wind in my face one more time. I want to play on a soccer team. You know, these extraordinary, extraordinary people who survive so much. And it's like I want to love the most ordinary thing of all. It shouldn't be extraordinary for people to love and give a damn. Right. And that's, that's a huge point. And so that it was my favorite yeah. part. I could, yeah. I didn't, I didn't really understand really the rest of all that was happening, but I did love that. Were you able to share that and communicate that? Well, so Luma and I, that's who we went to Greece together and we started this project with, I mean, she partnered with us to help us because, you know, she's, Jordanian, she could speak Arabic perfectly. Mm. And so she was a great partner to go over there and have that that journey with. I love that. The people that are listening to this podcast, um, it's a few thousand ambitious people that want to, they want to give a damn. That's the simplest way I can put it. And they're beginning to. I have story, just amazing stories. People quitting their jobs and going to do the thing they always felt they wanted to do. Mm. I have people in Brazil, people in Syria, people all over the place hitting me up saying like, this is really impacting me, right? These are people that are looking for um, ways to begin giving a damn. They're probably not, or they're not doing it intentionally. It's kind of like a, it just happens in their life, but they're not intentionally every day thinking, how can I um, love someone today? How can I give a damn about the people, places, and things around me? What would you say to them? They're saying, I want to start now, and I want it to start after this podcast because of this you know, incredible story that I'm hearing. What would you, what would be your take? What would you communicate to them as like just some good ways to begin based on your experiences, your life, the things that you did and are doing? You know, I do think people have to be gentle with themselves and gentle with the people around them. And so like, I know people do give a damn and it's easier to act on that when you're being pretty gentle with yourself and mm. merciful to yourself and showing that to other people. And it's as to me, it's as easy as that is to say, whoever is in front of you, mm -hmm. you know, show some kindness and mercy and love and then do that for yourself too. And there'll be a million opportunities that present themselves. If you are feeling some compassion and love and mercy towards this story of Thistle Farms and what we're about, you know, just go on the website. You can see a million things that we would love some help on. We'd love for people to share their own story of what surviving feels like and how, you know, community has been a part of their life and 
maybe share our story to have be social media advocates for us. That's something beautiful. The idea of um, you know volunteering. We have, like I said, forty to sixty, mm. depending on how you count it, sister communities around this country, and we can give you the name and where to volunteer in your area for women who are survivors. If you want to do that work, if you want to just understand and read more so that you feel like you have something to say. We have tons of resources on there. So I would start the exploration, if and not just about, it's not about trying to get people just to like yeah. us or buy our products, which they all should. Yeah. People should buy our products. I will, I will tell them to. I will strongly recommend that they do over and over again. Thank you. Yeah, I really will. Yeah, I think that's important what you just said. Um, uh, I interviewed Rain Wilson a few weeks ago, and he's on the podcast, and he said something really incredible. And again, it's like anti me who wants to like, just go after it. He said, find the thing that you're passionate about and then go into a humble posture of learning about that thing before you ever even start acting. Cause we want to yeah. act. Mm -hmm. People are going to hear this and be like, what can it, you know, they're just going to charge mm -hmm. into it. Or I want to go, you know, get all, like you said, get all the prostitutes off the street, get help, all, help them all get out. That's impossible, first of all. And second of all, we're going to go into it ill-informed, just not, we won't know about that thing truly. And I thought that was so such great advice from Rain. And you're alluding to that. Like, just find the thing, like, see if it lines up. Because that's all, all I'm trying to do is everybody has a thing that's going to connect to them. It might be one thing or two or three things, but just a few things that really connect with their story. This connects with your story, right? Like, there's a lot of pain in your past that is influenced the how you feel about the people that you get to love and be with every day. Yeah. So find those things. And then before you start the nonprofit and just go out there, <laughs> learn about it. Just be a listener, be a learner, hear, spend time with love. And then when you when you're when you feel holistically ready to go after it, then go. And you're gonna, I think people will be able to make more like they'll make better decisions about how to proceed, how to help, and all that, versus just going out there and just like Right. Right. And it's not, and like when you start something, you're not going to be in competition with everybody else doing that. Yeah. You're going to yeah. need to be friends with everybody. Yeah. The reason that you get bigger and you grow and you prosper is because we're all making friends with each other and yeah. helping each other out. And that's what yeah. I hope. I hope people, it is a humble posture, but it's also a posture of, of, of welcoming to other people, you know, and that's, we will. Like when you said, like, we could drop dead today. We could drop dead tomorrow. So just be nice. Yeah. <laughs> Start there, right? Right. We need, this world needs some kindness. Yes. In a big, big yes. way. I will not go into a uh, political conversation because it will be, that will be a curse laden conversation. But, um, curse word laden conversation. But I do have a question about, you mentioned, you started off with refugees. Mm hmm in this crazy political climate that we're in, there's a lot of talk about refugees on all sides of the spectrum. For some people that are listening, we don't have to convince them. We need to help. We need to figure out how to help them. We need to welcome them. How do we do it? How do we do it best? Some people are listening. I don't imagine they're on that train. So you have been, right? You just said three weeks ago, you're in Greece at the refugee camps. As someone who's been in it, there, present, and in it, uh, in all the facets of your life, what would you say? Just a quick couple sentences to the person that is up in the air, undecided about how we should treat, take care of, reach out to refugees. Well, I will say this, that again, just like there are around, you know, how women are trafficked and prostituted, there's so much misinformation and myths that, you know, I mean, I'm not having a conversation around immigration. I'm talking about refugees. refugees. That's a reality. Yeah. So That's less good. than 1% of all refugees ever get immigrated, ever. Mm. Wow. The average stay in a refugee camp is 17 years. Like the people from Syria will stay there until Assad. They're never coming here. They're never yeah. coming until Assad comes back. So there are refugees and they are having children and they are raising them in these camps. And we need to figure out how to be a part of that journey with them. In my mind, if we don't, without thinking about how that means, you know, um, around immigration, which is a whole nother conversation. This is really about refugees versus immigration yeah. at this point for us yeah. with the with the social enterprise starting there. So it's a way for women who have fled war but cannot flee the violence of poverty to figure out how to help them make a life for them and their children while they're in the midst of that trouble. That's it. I mean, it's not complicated. I love it. No, it's not. 
Yeah. It's not. Before the last question, last I want question. to honor you. Um, I hope this is a cash prize. It, it's super, super big amount. Um, <laughs> no, I, okay, I want to honor you. You, everything about you exudes, like you're not just, Love Heals, not just a thing. It's not just a bandwagon you've jumped on. Like I just met you an hour ago. You are a loving person and you have spent the better part of your life loving people. We didn't, I have a million more questions I could have asked you around that. And so I just want to honor the work that you're doing. I really do. I, I think you're an extraordinary person and um, I want to be available to help you do what you do better um, through what I'm doing on my platform or whatever else. And so I just, yeah, I want to just take a moment to just like straight up, not ask you a question, just say, you're incredible and um, keep being incredible. Keep doing what you're doing because I'm walking through these buildings and seeing uh, the work that you're doing and it's really good, impactful work. Thank you. That is so nice. I'm and serious. so what we really want to do though is people who are listening to your podcast. Yeah. When the day this airs, we want to offer in your honor just free shipping if everybody calls in okay. and just do the code. We'll do the code um, give a damn. Okay. Great. And I'll I'll have that. That's that's amazing. Very generous. We'll figure that out and I'll communicate that in another segment that I'll record to make sure everybody gets sure. it. And we'll push that because that's really generous. That'd be fun. And I would love for people to get them and then uh, for all of you listening, if you get some candles or some oils or whatever, like post it online, tell people to check it out. Because every time you buy a candle, which is going to make your life better, you are improving the lives of real people that have come out of incredibly tragic and shitty situations that are being like really healed and changed by the work here at Thistle Farms and the market and all of that. So it's incredible. Thank you so much for joining me thank today. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Much. Thank you. And thank I you. I hope to continue interacting with you over these things for we will. a long time to come. Thank for you. Sure. Don't go just yet, friends. Thanks for listening in. I have a few quick items to share with you before I let you go. One, you heard in our talk that Becca graciously offered a discount code so that you can get free shipping on your entire order when you go to the Thistle Farm store, which you should, and buy. So here are the instructions for that. Go to the store, fill up your cart, and during checkout, enter the code GIVEADAM, and you will get free shipping on your entire order, which can rack up if you're getting things like candles and stuff that can get pretty expensive. And so you get free and shipping on an entire order for US only, one use per customer, and it's active from today, June 27th, through July 27th. So for a full month, you can use this code one time. So I would urge you to use it and use it wisely and use it generously because when you use this code, give a damn, and you buy from this store, you're not only getting great products, things that are made well, you're not just getting great candles and great balms and stuff like that. You're also helping these incredible women that now have jobs because of Thistle Farms. So go be generous with that. Let's show them that you truly give a damn by uh, helping this platform grow. And in addition to that, I would hope that you would go online and spread the news of Thistle Farms and what Becca Stevens and her team are doing. Second to last, if you would like to support the show, please do one of two things or both. You can leave a review on iTunes and you can support us by contributing monthly on a platform called Patreon. Go to Patreon dot com forward slash let's give a damn to find out more that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash let's give a damn leaving a review and contributing through this platform help us do what we do better and get into the ears and eyes and hearts and lives of more people lastly if you have any feedback encouragement discouragement ideas or whatever hit me up at hello at nicklapara.com or on social media at nicklapara or at let's give a damn everywhere as we leave, Desmond Tutu left us with this great quote, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. Friends, that's what you and I are. We're hope-filled people who refuse to settle for the status quo. So go out and live that way. Go out and live like you mean that, like you believe that this week. I love you all. Until next week, bye. Bye.